So now we will speak of composition operators on uh, the Hardy space H2. Uh, I will begin with. Uh, can you can you read like that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, with a semi-group. It's not. Okay. Sorry. Uh, with a semi-group property, which is a, well, a triviality. If you consider two uh, self-maps of uh, D, and if you compose them, which we are, you are allowed to do, C times phi composed with phi is just C psi composed with C phi. This is Bourbaki exercise. Uh, just observe that you have to compose in the reverse order. <laughs> That's all, uh, complete triviality, but well, it sounds well for the beginning. So I will be interested in the four questions which are here. So I consider a uh, map T, and my maps T will always be C phi. And in principle, you see the map H2 into the holomorphic functions on D. So uh, it's not clear that they are made of bounded operators. And it turns out that it's always the fact. And it will be also the fact if I take for H the Bergman space. And it will be no longer the fact if I take the Dirichlet space. That's why for the Dirichlet space, <coughs> things are more complicated in a sense. So the first point is uh, it's always bounded. Whatever psi E is phi is t is a bounded operator uh, this is a this is due to little wood and this is a fairly old stuff uh, 1925 or something like that it is called the little wood subordination principle and it's a uh, both uh, old and uh, highly non-trivial. It, it's a non-trivial thing. Uh, there are several proofs. Uh, one of them is a delightful use of subharmonic uh, functions. Uh, maybe I, I will not uh, give the proof uh, for lack of time. But let me mention that what about the norm of C phi? Well, the norm of C phi, for example, is dominated by this quantity, phi of square root of 1 plus mod phi of 0 over 1 minus mod phi of 0. And this is not sharp in general. And what is norm of C phi? Nobody knows. This is no, well, maybe this does not fascinate mathematicians, but one know, does not know how to give a closed formula for the norm of a composition operators on H2. And even if you take very simple symbols, like affine symbols, AZ plus B, say with A plus B equal to 1, and say A and B positive, then you can compute exactly the norm of C phi. It's 1 over square root of A, but you have to prove it, and it's not so, so, so trivial. Of course, if you do it brutally, you, you take a function f, uh, you take its um, Taylor expansion and replace z by az plus b, uh, expand az plus b to the n by the binomial formula per mute, uh, you are in the middle of nowhere. You see, you, you, have, to, you have to be more precise. So uh, anyway, we have this, uh, this fact that t is always bounded. and. Uh, so what does it mean? It means that if we take the, uh, the norm of C phi f, um, I'm so used, C phi f is just f composed with phi. So this is, uh, this can be written as the integral of f composed with phi 
of u square dm of u and I integrate over the circle. As you know, the norm in H2 can be obtained by integrating on the unique circle and here uh, m is just a normalized Lebesgue measure or ha measure of t. And here I will be uh, a little vague. f composed with phi is just f of phi of u square dm of u. And now I make a change of variable. I write phi of u is w and say that w belongs to d. In principle, I should put a bar, but let us assume that uh, phi of u is less than 1. And this is the same as the integral now over d. Uh, can you still read here? Yeah, of f of w square dm phi of w, where m phi is the, the pullback measure of uh, the Harmagean under phi. Uh, uh, I should put, you know, uh, well, uh, here phi restricted to to d to the circle to t. And so you, you have this inequality. The norm of f of w square dm phi of w. Now that you know by Littlewood that this is uh, say bounded uh, like that. This exactly means that m phi is a Carlson measure for H2. So the point of view of Carlson measures does not, in principle, help you to prove the boundedness of T. But conversely, if you know this boundedness by Littlewood subordination principle, you are allowed to say that M phi is always a Carlson measure, whatever phi from D to D is. Uh, and so uh, we will, uh, that's why I was committing this mistake. I will denote by rho phi what I called rho mu before, rho m phi. And it turns out that this quantity will play uh, an important role in the, the answer to these four questions. So I want to say more on general uh, things. Yeah, maybe uh, some uh, uh, some general facts. Well, of course, T, uh, we suppose that T is compact. We don't yet know when composition operators are compact. Suppose we have a compact operator. We have its Schmidt decomposition. So T which will always be C phi for me, you can write it like that, Sj, uh, well, x, vj, x will be now mostly f, a function, so tx. And then we have this equation, obviously, t of vj is Sj, uj. So vj is not an eigenvector of t, but nearly, in some sense. It maps vj to Sj, uj, but uh, for t, when you are given a uh, uh, map phi, you don't know this decomposition. This decomposition is something abstract. So, uh, well, this is in some sense useless. But what you will know is that if you consider the adjoint of this operator, and if you let it act on the reproducing kernel of your space, it's k at the point phi of a. So in some sense, this uh, equation, but I will prove it because I 
I have to prove things from time to time. This equation will replace this one and will turn out to be useful. So I prove that. So even if it's obvious, you take the scalar product of some function f with c phi star of k a. Well, by definition, this is c phi of f k a. That is to say, f composed with phi k sub a. This is f composed with phi at the point a, or if one prefers f at the point phi of a, that is to say f at the point k phi of a. And so this is equal to, to that. This is uh, clear. Um, OK. It will come back. And well, there is also something uh, which turns out to be uh, very useful, which can, be, which might be called the reproducing kernel test. Uh, there is also the reproducing kernel thesis, which is something different. But what is the reproducing kernel test? Well, if T is compact, then you can see that this works for any Hilbert space of analytic functions on D, as uh, well as what I'm going to say. If T is compact, then the limit as A tends to 1 of the norm of K phi of A over the norm of K is equal to 0, at least for H one of our three um, spaces, H2, B2, and D. D, which is nothing but D0, as in the course of yesterday. And uh, let me prove that. Uh, if you consider the sequence of normalized reproducing kernels, which were called K hat, I guess, yesterday, so Ka over the norm of Ka, in our spaces, it, they, they tend weakly to zero as modulus of A tends to one. This is easy to, to show. I, I don't detail it. Um, so if T is compact, it's a joint. That is to say, C phi star is compact as well. And so C phi star of K sub A over norm of k sub a tends to zero, but this time in norm, since c phi star is compact. But we know that c phi star of k sub a is k phi of a, so this means that, uh, well, exactly what I wrote above, k phi of a over k of a tends to zero. And in the case, let us go back to our hardy space H2. Here, this exactly means, uh, because I, I, I recall that, the, of course, the norm of k a square <coughs> is k sub a of a. And here, k sub a of z, as you know, is 1 over 1 minus a bar z. So if you. Uh, decode what this means. This exactly means that the limit as a tends to 1 of 1 minus phi of a over 1 minus a is equal to infinity. So you have a 
don't know if you can read it. You have a necessary condition for compactness. This is absolutely necessary that you have that. And for example, uh, as a consequence, uh, if you take a map like that, 1 plus z over 2, an affine map, a self-map of, of d, it will fail to pass that test and c phi is not compact. So, what about the converse? The converse holds uh, converse is okay for phi uh, injective or more generally finitely valent or boundedly valent. I don't know which means that the number of pre-images of a point under phi is bounded, say, by 1,000 or something like that, a fixed number. So the, the, this is OK for a finitely valent map. And this is uh, wrong in general. For example, you have uh, infinite Blaschke products which verify this condition, which might be called slow Blaschke product. And uh, those Blaschke products induce uh, their inner functions, and so they induce uh, isometric composition operators, which, of course, cannot be compact. So the compactness is something much more delicate. <coughs> And uh, this is why I left uh, the four questions at the blackboard. So boundedness is solved by Littlewood in uh, 1925. Compactness is uh, touched here, but not completely characterized. And the solution came much later. And the theorem is as follows. Well, indeed, there are two, uh, two, two ways of formulating that answer, there is one by Barbara McClure in 85, and another one by Joël Shapiro in 87. And, uh, well, the characterization of Barbara McClure is the following. C phi is compact on H2, if and only if, what I called rho phi of h, which was a big O of h by the Carlison embedding theorem and the fact that m phi is a Carlison measure. Well, any analyst has a Pavlovian uh, reaction. Uh, you replace big O by little o, and this works. This is little o of h as h tends to 0. But of course, this is highly frustrating because if you are given an explicit symbol, how will you test that? It turns out that you can in some sense, uh, in some cases. And uh, this is a characterization of Barbara McClure. And uh, there is another one by Shapiro in terms of, uh, well, I just mentioned it because I will not use it, of the nevan linear counting function. This is the number, you, you look at the number of pre-images of uh, W under phi, and then you, you put a weight, uh, you can put this way, well, to formulate it exactly as Shapiro did, logarithm of 1 over z. This is a little o of uh, 1 minus W. So you see two characterizations rather sophisticated and completely different. One in terms of Carlson measures, the other one in terms of the so-called Nevan-Lina counting function. And maybe this uh, uh, second characterization drew more attention because you can even compute the so-called essential norm of phi, that is to say the, the distance of C phi to the compact operators on H2, 
explicitly in terms of this function. So uh, if uh, uh, okay, so uh, if uh, this uh, quotient n phi of w over uh, one over w tends to zero. Uh, then your operator is compact, and otherwise you have its defect of compactness, which can be computed exactly. Uh, but uh, when we try to estimate the rate of decay of the approximation numbers, we were unable, uh, with uh, Daniel Lee, Pascal Lefebvre, and uh, Luis Rodriguez Piazza, to use that characterization, because we were unable to to obtain satisfactory estimates on this function, and we, we use that function. So here are the, the two first questions, which are essentially answered, but in a very theoretical way. And what about the third question? Let me see if I don't forget anything. Yeah, what about Chatterness? This was characterized by Lue King in 87 in terms of M phi rho phi. For example, uh, if rho phi of H, which we know is a big O of H, is a big O of H to the power alpha for some alpha bigger than one. So if we have a really much smaller behavior, then C phi belongs to S P for P bigger than two over alpha minus one. I don't want to state explicitly the characterization of Lue King because it's fairly long and technical, but uh, we, uh, we can uh, remind that. And uh, well, uh, same thing. We had a complete characterization of Chatterness in, given by Lue King, uh, but once more, which was very difficult to test. For example, Saracen in uh, 88, I think, asked the question, is it possible to find a composition operator on H2 which is compact and in no Shatton class? And uh, well, the answer is uh, yes. So there exists C phi, which is compact and which is in no Shatton class. C phi does not belong to the union for P finite of sp and uh, this was proved uh, by uh, uh, Carol and Cowan in, 80, in 91 I think and uh, they did not use working terms they made a self uh, uh, self-contained proof because uh, it's difficult to use that proof so anyway you see the situation is uh, fairly uh, difficult even for uh, those questions and now I will uh, dwell more in detail on the rate of decay of approximation numbers after this general picture. <coughs> okay. So let me recall a definition you consider a sequence u say g bigger than 1 included in the unit disk and you want to know when the, uh, yes this beacon Okay, okay. So finally, I can. I guess you know that by heart now. You can. <coughs> so 
So I have a, a sequence in the unit disk, and I want just to uh, define its interpolation constant. So m sub u is the infimum of the constant c's, such that for every bounded sequence, this was mentioned yesterday in the talk of Professor Orbert, uh, there exists a function f in h infinity, such that f of uj is wj, and the soup norm of f, norm of f in h infinity, is less than uh, yeah, C, sorry. This is the definition. Indeed, uh, what I will do is to work with finite sequences. U will be a finite sequence, so obviously it's an interpolation sequence. Uh, but the main point will be the behavior of this interpolation constant. It's like local Banach space geometry. Students uh, have a tendency to think that in finite dimension all norms are equivalent. This is the end of the story. And uh, it is not, as you, as you know, Dvorsky's theorem and, and so on and so forth. So I will be interested in that constant. And uh, there is a, uh, well, I'll take for you a finite sequence of length n, by the way. U is U1, UN. I will consider the space generated by the corresponding reproducing kernels, KU1, KUN, which might be called a model space, because you know it's the orthogonal of the shift invariance of space BU H2, where BU is a, just a finite Blaschke product associated with that sequence. And uh, what else? What do I want to say? Ah, yeah. So the, you have the following theorem, which you can find in the, the book of Nikolai on the shift operator. Uh, if you consider a finite combination of, or a combination of those reproducing kernels. It is less that m sub u than the sum of squares of the norms, kuj square to the one half, and you have a similar inequality from below. So what does that mean? It means that a sequence of reproducing kernel is surely no longer an orthonormal sequence, but it is um, something which resembles an orthonormal sequence. It is a, a Ries sequence with constants which are related to the interpolation constant of the sequence u in that way. Okay? Another way to phrase it is to say that the sequence of reproducing kernel is unconditional in the Hilbert space H with unconditionality constant M sub U. Okay? Uh, let us uh, uh, take that for, for granted. Uh, so, can I write, am I allowed to write here? No? <laughs> no, no. <coughs> uh, okay, so uh, here is one theorem, which I will prove in detail, just to show the, the use of interpolation sequences. So, uh, suppose you are 
given a sequence like that, u1, un, and uh, v, the sequence uh, v1, vn, which is just the sequence of images and of phi of the uges. vj is phi of uj, and uh, assume that the vj's are distinct. And so, uh, yeah, set mu sub n is the infimum for j between 1 and n of the quotient where uh, k vj over k u j What I'm going to state is a fairly sharp lower bound for the approximation numbers of phi. Then uh, a sub n of c phi is larger than mu sub n, uh, the product of interpolation constant of u and v, and uh, is larger than mu sub n mv to the minus 2. So here is the, the theorem, and we will uh, prove it in detail. Uh, so I am uh, I recall that a sub n so uh, I can go. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. I recall that a sub n of c phi is e sub n of c phi star. <laughs> I was wondering what's going. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is b sub n of c phi star. So now I use the Bernstein numbers. And B sub n, I recall this is the supremum for the dimension of E equal to n of the infimum for f in the unit sphere of E of C phi star f. And indeed, uh, if we want to obtain good lower bounds, we have to choose E in a nearly optimal way. And that we do completely at random because we have no complete com comprehension of the situation. We take for E a model space, and then we will try to choose the points U1, Un, depending on the symbol phi, as well as possible. So that's why I take a, well, a model space. So let me take now a function f, so the sum from 1 to n of lambda g k u j in the unit sphere of E. So uh, wh what do I know from that? I know that uh, 1 is equal to the norm of f squared, the h2 norm. I omit the symbol h2. And uh, by this uh, theorem, which we admitted, this is bigger than mu square times the sum of lambda g square k u g square. You will see the proof is simple. Uh, and so now, what about c phi star f? But by our mapping equation, c phi star f is nothing but the sum from 1 to n of lambda j k vj. So let me take the norm. And uh, use once more this theorem. This is larger than m sub v to the minus 2, the sum of lambda j square k vj square. 
So uh, I have those two equations, uh, one with kuj, the other one with kvj. So to compare those two equations, I use this parameter mu, which is the infimum of those quotients, and then uh, I can have as a lower bound mv to the minus 2 mu n square by definition the sum from 1 to n of lambda g square norm of k u g square but now this sum I know that it is bigger than mu to the minus 2 so this is bigger than mu n square uh, mv minus 2 mu minus 2 so now what I do well I uh, this implies with my notations that the infimum of the unit sphere of those quantities so what I called gamma e of c phi star is larger than mu n mv to the minus 1 mu to the minus 1 so I have the first part of the statement and the second one is obvious I guess it is obvious and uh, well mu is less than mv is it clear for you or no so let us <coughs> let us explain why this is obvious so you have a, a sequence wj say bounded by one and then we can uh, find a function j such that uh, f g of vj is wj and the norm of j why do I call it j and not f uh, anyway uh, mv no sorry I prefer to call it f and now you consider the function g which is f composed with phi which still belongs to L infinity and you have, yeah I think it g of uj is f of phi of uj that's to say f of vj wj and of course uh, the norm of j infinity is less than the norm of f infinity which is less than uh, mv I call that those bounds which are infimum are attained by a normal family argument so, so you have that and you, you have that so what about this theorem uh, can it be of some use on some examples that's the point because uh, how to choose u1 un uh, how to estimate those uh, uh, parameters which appear in the statement that is what we will see on a specific example And uh, that specific example will be uh, that of so-called lens maps. So this is a good testing bench for all those questions. Well, so what is a lens map? You take a parameter theta between 0 and 1 and you perform a conformal mapping from the disk to the right half plate C0 which is the set of W 
whose real part is positive. And so you start from, from D. By T, you go to your right half plane. And then you raise things at the power theta. Let me call gamma theta this mapping. Gamma theta of W is W to the power theta. And so you still go in C0. And then you come back by T minus 1, and you come back to D. And phi theta, the so-called lens map, is just the composition T minus 1, gamma theta, T. So on the picture, it goes like that. You have the disk. Then you go to the half plane. Then you uh, raising things at the power theta, theta less. So this is T. Uh, by gamma theta, you will obtain uh, a wedge uh, of, I think, opening here, or half opening, theta pi over 2. And then you go back by t minus 1, and you have, in some sense, shrinked your uh, unit disk. And so you end up with a picture like that. That's why it's called a lens map. So here is the image phi theta of D. And you have, uh, OK, this is our, our map. Uh, it is completely explicit if we want, because T and gamma theta are explicit. And it, uh, if I uh, test this theorem, uh, Is it okay? It's <laughs> and uh, here is the theorem. Uh, we have that a sub n of c phi theta is bigger than e times e to the minus b square root of n. And this is less than, with other constants, the same thing, a prime e to the minus b prime square root of n. So we have a rather sharp description of the approximation numbers of that symbol, except that we say nothing on the constant a, b, a prime, b prime appearing here. And of course, this implies that c phi theta belongs to all Shatton classes, SP, which was known. This has been proved by Shapiro and Taylor in 73. But of course, and so we, we know that if we have that situation, the approximation numbers decay faster than any power of 1 over n. But here, the, the behavior is much more precise. And uh, well, the upper bound, I will discuss it uh, maybe uh, in the third uh, talk, or maybe not, if I want to speak of the Dirichlet space. Let me uh, show you how it, this general theorem can give you uh, the lower bound. So I have to choose now my sequences u and v. And uh, I choose them li like that. uj is 1 minus rho j. And then Vj is whatever it can. Vj is phi theta of Uj. And rho is between 0 and 1. And will be adjusted later. So it's a radial sequence, which in some sense tends to 1 as j tends to infinity. I say in some sense, because anyway, my sequence has length n, and rho will depend on n. So everything is uh, uh, 
uh, fixed. And so uh, mu n behaves, uh, so you have to be believe me, like rho to the power n times 1 minus theta. It is, uh, well, easy to, to check. What about mu or mv? Finally, it's enough for me to speak about mv. So, of course, v is an interpolation sequence. It's a finite sequence. But what about its behavior? Uh, well, mv is less than e to the power v over 1 minus rho, where v is a constant, a numerical constant. Maybe it will not be this one, but anyway, it's a, it's a constant. And how do we prove that? Uh, we use uh, the characterization by Carlson of interpolation constants, which, were, which was given uh, yesterday. We, we have to make the product of uh, uh, pseudo-hyperbolic distances of those points, estimate things, and we fall rather easily on that uh, behavior. And it's important for me to have a precise estimate because later on rho will vary. So this gives me now a sub n of c phi theta is bigger than, uh, I put a symbol like that because maybe there are numerical constants which I want to forget, uh, mu sub n, so rho to the n 1 minus theta, and then e to the minus, well, I should put 2b here. Okay, but uh, so this, I have that. And uh, I will take rho under the form, say, e to the minus epsilon. So you can imagine that this will be bigger than the exponential of uh, minus n uh, minus a constant c times uh, uh, n epsilon plus, you know, 1 minus rho will behave like epsilon. 1 minus e to the minus 1 epsilon is like epsilon. So I fall on such an estimate. And of course now the only thing which I can still do is to optimize the choice of epsilon. <coughs> And so, of course, the choice, the best choice of epsilon corresponds to the fact that those two numbers are the same. So, epsilon is 1 over square root of n, and so you see, uh, well, uj is whatever it can, and you obtain uh, a sub n of c phi theta is, uh, well, bigger than some constant, and then e to the minus c square root of n. And it turns out that this, uh, so I should finish now, Sasha? Oh. Well, okay. Uh, it turns out that this is Sha, and we, uh, we will see that uh, maybe next time. And here we will make uh, the, the, the we will make use of the definition of approximation numbers as Gelfand number. So here you see lower bound using Bernstein numbers. I will say a word next, uh, the last uh, talk uh, of the use of veil inequalities for lower bounds, and here using Gelfand numbers and some technique, we obtain the, the upper bound. And then, since I am short of time, well, I will stop here. Okay. I have some more question. Uh, uh, well, uh, this B and uh, B prime constants, they depend on theta. Exactly. And w we can follow the way they depend on theta. So, for example, uh, uh, you see, I, uh, you, you can more or less take B or B prime is, I guess, 1 or minus theta 
over theta. And this uh, degenerates correctly as theta tends to zero and as theta tends to one. If theta is equal to one, we have done nothing. Our mapping is the identity. It's not compact. And so, we, well, we obtain a bound by some uh, absolute constant. If theta is equal to zero, uh, we have shrinked everything to a point. Our mapping is a constant mapping, so uh, the approximation numbers should be zero. And indeed, uh, uh, then you get uh, minus infinity. So, so it degenerates correctly. Yes, we, we can do. We can do that. Yeah. No questions. <coughs> Not, uh, let's take the speaker again. <laughs> we continue in 10 minutes.